Understanding the details of muscle growth will always grab attention. Whether it's the average person looking to get fit efficiently or a serious lifter looking to reach new heights, the details matter. Consequently, a recently published study by Van Vossel and colleagues stirred up quite the interest on social media, suggesting evidence that muscle may relocate from untrained sites to muscles targeted during the training program. In this second installment of the Methods Matter series, we'll discuss why this conclusion may be a bit premature. When it comes to primary training concepts, specificity is almost always at the top of the list. This principle states that the body will make specific adaptations to impose demands or will change accordingly to the style of training performed. The principle of specificity is a bit less commonly discussed in the context of hypertrophy compared to training for strength. In my view, specificity for hypertrophy is about how targeted the training stimulus is for a given muscle, specific region within that muscle, and theoretically even the composition of that muscle growth. Think things like fiber type specific hypertrophy. I like this definition for hypertrophy as it makes it clear that muscle growth is a seemingly local process. Back in the early 2000s, this topic was hotly debated in the research. To put this dispute into practical example, you may have heard that performing heavy squats in your training program improves muscle growth overall due to the systemic hormonal effects like increased testosterone that compound movements have on the body. This claim was put to the test in a series of studies out of the lab at McMaster University in Canada. First, a study by Wilkinson and colleagues demonstrated that muscle growth can occur in the absence of meaningful changes in systemic hormones that are often linked to anabolism. Then, a follow-up study by Weston colleagues showed that acute upregulation of anabolic signaling in the biceps were unaffected by systemic hormone levels that were manipulated by performing unilateral biceps curls with or without lower body training performed immediately after. Then, the same study had participants trained with these protocols for 15 weeks and demonstrated that muscle growth was unaffected by the systemic hormone levels. Ultimately, this line of research does a really solid job demonstrating how muscle growth seems to be a pretty local process in which a given tissue responds to the stimulus that's provided. And that brings us to the present study by Van Vossel and colleagues. The present study by Van Vossel and colleagues is part of an awesome large-scale data collection that has already produced a few cool studies. To briefly outline the project, 21 untrained participants performed a unilateral training program in which one limb performed lower volume and frequency training and the other performed higher volume and higher frequency training. For this paper, however, the results of the limbs were summed together such that each individual had a single data point contributing for each muscle group measured. The training program was focused on the upper and lower limb muscles, so the elbow flexor and extensors and the knee flexor and extensors, whereas other muscles like the calves were not trained. The authors measured the muscle volume via MRI of 30 muscles before and after the training program. Importantly, there were 10 primarily recruited muscles, 7 secondarily recruited muscles, and 13 non-recruited muscles. Participants were further separated after the fact into low and high energy intake groups um, to see if nutrition may have influenced the results between participants. To summarize the results, let's take a look at the main figure from the paper. You can see that the primary and secondarily recruited muscles all show significant positive changes in muscle size, which is intuitive, you grow what you train. However, the results of the non-recruited muscles is what stirred up the discussion. You can see multiple muscles that display negative changes in muscle size and even two muscles that reach statistical significance. To quote the conclusion section of the paper directly, to our knowledge, this is the first study documenting that some non-recruited muscles significantly atrophy during a period of resistance training. Our data therefore suggests muscle mass reallocation, i.e. that hypertrophy in the recruited muscles takes place at the expense of atrophy in non-recruited muscles, especially when energy and protein availability are limited. So the question is, do we really lose muscle to gain it? I personally don't think so, so let's break this down. This study provides an awesome example to discuss the concept of multiplicity. In traditional frequentist statistics, the common significance threshold is set as 0.05, which is also called the alpha level. The idea here is that over the long run, our risk of making a type 1 error or what's called a false positive is around 5%. The classic example for a type 1 error is telling someone who isn't pregnant that they are. This is a roughly 5% error rate is what we accept as a worthwhile trade-off in most fields of study. Now this assumption of a known type 1 error rate only applies when the assumptions of a given statistical test are abided by and only a single test is performed. When multiple tests are performed, the error rates compound in a way that isn't entirely intuitive. In the present study, while it's not entirely clear from the methods, I estimated somewhere between 116 and 174 statistical tests were performed with no mention of a correction for multiple comparisons. To visualize what's happening here, I simulated what the expected type one error rate would be under these conditions. With a conservative estimate of 90 tests performed in the current study, which these are the tests that only directly apply to the individual muscle volumes. 
You can see as the number of comparisons rise, there's a logarithmic curve that is asymptotically approaching a 100% chance of making a type one error. For unadjusted comparisons, that's labeled in red. You can see at the intersection of the orange lines, I estimated the current study with a 99% chance of making a type one error. When applying a correction for multiple comparisons, you can see in the blue line, maintaining the desired type one error rate of 5%. To put simply, I don't really put much stock into the significant decreases in muscle size observed or the correlations observed with energy or protein intake. The reality is it's very likely just noise that is being picked up um, due to the number of tests that were performed. But we can take things a step further and look at this from a magnitude perspective as well. When I first saw the figure of non-recruited muscles that was getting a lot of buzz on social media, to me it immediately stuck out as just a normal distribution clustered around a mean of zero. Here you can see a distribution of changes in muscle size from the current study in red and a normal distribution simulated with a mean of zero and the exact same variance in blue. The point here is that the variability in the changes in muscle size are perfectly compatible with no changes in muscle uh, whatsoever. I also plotted the mean differences of each of the non-recruited muscles with confidence intervals that were both adjusted and unadjusted for multiple comparisons. You can see that all but one of the muscle's confidence intervals now cross zero, which indicates no significant difference. And using some rough approximations of measurement error, all of the estimates are compatible with what I would personally call a trivial effect size. There are other things that I think could be further contributing to the excessive error rates, like pseudo-replication. Pseudo-replication is essentially when dependent observations, like 30 muscle volumes coming from the same participant, are considered independent. Here is a basic example that demonstrates how much of an influence this has on the precision of our estimates, and consequently the result of significance tests. From a practical perspective, I think this study does a good job in showing the difference between confirmatory and exploratory research. To be clear, I have no issues with the authors exploring the data in this manner to potentially uncover some interesting results that may warrant further investigation. But this needs to be factored into the way the data are interpreted. I've seen a few posts on social media that seem to make the case that this muscle relocation effect is definitely a thing and discuss how this may influence our training. While I completely understand how that is enticing, hopefully this video goes to show you why I think that can be a bit misleading. When interpreting research, I think shot callers should be rewarded. Things like pre-registering your hypotheses and statistical analyses prior to the data being collected, having a well-targeted research question, and attempting to achieve adequate statistical power for that research question are the foundations of effective hypothesis testing. The best analogy I can think of is a dartboard. Imagine two different scenarios. In the first, you watch someone throw three darts at the board, one hits the bullseye, and two are very close. In the second, you watch someone throw 100 darts at the board. There are darts at every corner and five hitting the bullseye. Who do you believe is a superior dart thrower? Chances are you're going to value the first individual as they demonstrated competency immediately with limited attempts even though they actually got fewer darts on the bullseye. The same thing goes with hypothesis testing. Given the nature of error rates, we're bound to find some false positives some of the time, thinking something is there when it's not. This only gets worse as the number of comparisons are made increases, and thus well-targeted hypotheses should be rewarded and viewed with more confidence. To wrap things up, while I think the muscle reallocation effect is an interesting idea that definitely warrants in further investigation, I don't find the current study as particularly strong evidence to support it and potentially modify training based upon it. The reality is, with a number of statistical tests that were performed, it's more probable than not that a false positive is occurring somewhere, which in reality is just random noise occurring. Going back to the first study I mentioned by Wilkinson and colleagues, the within participants design had subjects only training one limb, while the other limb served as a non-training control. Significant growth was observed in the training limb, while no meaningful changes were observed in the control limb, and this would seem to go against the hypothesis of muscle reallocation, at least to some degree. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, and let us know what you'd like to see from the Methods Mata series next in the comments. If you want more free content like this directly in your inbox, sign up for our newsletter, which is the first link below.